There's probably no scene that people remember in Deliverance that's even remotely as powerful in their recollection as the squeal like a pig scene where Bobby is raped by one of the mountain men. And in the filming of Deliverance, everybody knew that scene was coming. And because it was filmed sequentially, there was a, a lot of tension building up to that scene. For me, the problem was the location, where to shoot it. And I looked and looked and looked, and eventually I found this place, which was laurels, which had these acid green leaves. And once I found that, I knew really how to shoot it. This river don't go to entry. You done taken the wrong turn. Casting, first of all, the man who played the toothless one, he worked on a dude ranch with uh, Bert Reynolds, and Bert told me about him. Uh, John said to me, I can't find the other guy. And I, you know, I've got lots of southern actors, but they won't take their front teeth out. And it's a plot point. I said, the actors are funny about that. They don't want to pull their front teeth. But I, I worked with a guy. And I used to do the stunt, a stunt show in Ghost Town, North Carolina. He had no front teeth. The guy's name was Cowboy Coward. Now, he stutters, but he was a hell of an actor. And he played Pa Clinton in the shootout, the OK Corral. And he said, you think you can find him? I said, I don't know. I said, I, uh, this had been 15 years before, maybe more. So I called Ghost Town. I said, do you, do you possibly know where Cowboy Coward is? And they said, yeah, he's right here. So he came in, and he was amazing. He got a little pretty mouth, ain't he? The other guy, I saw a lot of people for that part. And obviously, it was very, very difficult. And he had an extraordinary quality. Bill McKinney, who was sensational in this part so intimidating so deranged powerful physically too unusual guy very good guy who was a, a tree surgeon from los angeles <laughs> as one of his jobs an actor a singer and a tree surgeon and because in a certain sense when we approaching the scene it, it sort of cut them off from everybody there were these two and they had to do this much a contemporary sexual person you know um but I didn't read that much sex into it. The scene wasn't going to be particularly physical the way it was written. But when we came up to start you know, getting ready to actually doing it, Mr. Borman said, uh, I, I just don't believe it. He said, I don't believe this guy's you know, going to drop his laundry and then just sort of give in to this. He said, I want you to run. I'm about protecting him, too. You know, so it's, it's, it's uh, interesting thinking back on it those things that come to your mind, you know, although I'm, there's contempt there, but I'm still, I'm taking care of him. I'm not losing control. To be violated, it takes a lot of courage. <laughs> it takes a lot of courage for a man to do that. He's one hell of an actor. I bet you squeal. I bet you squeal like pig. Oh, we squeal. Squeal now. Squeal. 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 Squeal louder. Squeal. Squeal like a pig. The line itself came about because the need to do it for television, to a cleaned up version. You know, squeal like a pig was one of the things we came up with as being a kind of harmless thing that could be substituted for these F words. And it, it worked so well that I abandoned the F words and used that instead. And it was much more effective. It was tastefully done, but it was horrifying at the same time. Because we thought doing this scene in a horrifying way. Well, after Bill McKinney is shot, this debate goes on about what to do with him. And he has to play dead there. And this is an extraordinary discipline, this man. Was, you know, he mustn't blink, he mustn't breathe. And he was able to do this as we shot this long sequence that went on around him. Death is like no responsibility, really. I spotted on that tree twice for six minutes and 45 seconds and I, without blinking, right? And this guy comes running there with a stopwatch. He said, Jesus, you remember, you know how long you stayed with your eyes open? I said, no. He said, 6.45. So we did it again, I did it again. But see, the atmosphere was right. It was a little bit on the moist side, humid. Yeah. Ned's performance was so devastating in that. And obviously that scene afterwards is my big scene in the film. This ain't one of your fucking games! killed somebody and preparing for that scene was the easiest thing in the world i mean 
I would just get myself out of breath just because we had supposed to have been running up. I mean, then that was easy. You could run in place or do push-ups or do whatever just to get yourself where you're actually heaving a little bit. And then right before the scene was done, I would just go over and hug Ned. I mean, all you got to do is go look at his face and, and, and emotion. They're in this place, cut off from the world. As the Burt Reynolds character says, there's no law. They carry him. Then there's a series of scenes then, which I did, where they carry this body on their on their back, so it's redolent of some burial of some ancient chieftain. Then they have to claw out a grave with their hands. And Drew is the moralist who is completely against this idea that they should take the law into their own hands. Important things, and it's an important shot. It's really important that you make his death in enigmatic. Boyd thinks he killed himself and because that was what his character would think and mine would think he was killed. I decided for my own purposes that Drew didn't get shot. He didn't commit suicide. He's too strong a Catholic to ever do that. But maybe his paddle hit a rock, spun him out, he hit his head on a rock, he drowned. Arm is right across like this and all, all we did was rub a little make a little bruise under the armpit here. He said, you know, John, I said, I can do a really weird thing with my shoulders. And he said, let me see it. So I showed it, and he, he almost fell down. He just thought it was the greatest thing he'd ever seen. And so, I mean, there, there are rages of people about whether that's prosthetic or how they did that. And it's just me. We shot more than a week in this little lagoon which is in the bottom of the waterfall, and we could control the water, actually, on that waterfall. And we got permission from the water authorities that we could actually uh, control the water whenever we needed. it. So it was like being in a Universal Studios in a back lot. If they would have built a waterfall, it, that's the way it would have looked like, actually, basically. For the smashing of the canoes, we were able to build a rail in so that the canoe was running along this rail, and uh, both canoes were on rail so that they were able to collide like that and then the wooden canoe was was rigged so it broke apart and so having put all this in place with no water then we would open the sluices let the water come down one place where we use a, a, a double for a void <laughs> Bert wanted to do it himself Bert said I don't want to have to tell people that there was a, a stomach I did my own stuff he sent a dummy over and it looked awful and I said to him I can do that, John. And he went, you can do that? I said, yeah. It's his leg and he's dragged up. Ah! Well, that was just a, a lamb bone. I took the bone and broke it backwards and then tore a hole in the stuff, the bone, and stuck it out and poured the blood on it. And uh, John, as only John would do, went, so it's good. Everybody else went, oh, my. Yeah, I mean, they were just because it was like diabolique, you know, it was, it was uh, petrifying. Voigt has to become Bert, take on the role, and find within himself this hunter, this primal man, and he has to climb this rock face, this everything that he, he was. And he goes on as this man who has become someone else, from being this gentle, easygoing guy, he's now become this killer. <coughs> For me, all those scenes that follow after they escape from the river were the most interesting scenes in the, in, in, in the film. I think that that's, a tr that's the truth of people who uh, come back from war. Really rest in peace, that that nightmare will always be threatening. They will never be able to put this experience uh, to rest. And I think, you know, I think it's a, it's a good note to end the film on. I got this guy who was a very good diver who did the stunt for John Voight to go under the water and put a, just a, a rubber glove on. I want to show you the idea of a hand would be swollen from the water. And so we just put this rubber glove on him and he went under and he brought his hand up. That's how we did it. When I first saw it, I thought, 
I don't know about that. And then when I saw it with an audience and the audible gasp uh, was sensational. You know, I started as an editor myself. And so we cut the pictures, went along, and three days actually after I'd finished the shooting, we had a cut. So within a week of finishing shooting, I, the studio was watching the film. You know, I think often violence on film is I think dishonest when, you know, bang, the shot fired and he falls. Eventually, I took out from the death scene. But, you know, we were a little bit scared about the rape scene and, you know, how the people are going to accept it and all that. So we, we, we didn't think that uh, it was going to be that successful, the way it became. Well, then the picture opened and it got quite an adverse reaction to the violence, and particularly to the rape scene. But the reviews were generally good and it was a huge success. I met someone just a couple of years ago who said to me, oh, I saw that film of yours, Deliverance, when it came out. He said, I walked out halfway through and I've never been back to the cinema since. <laughs> so I think a lot of people uh, were, were put off by it. The first thing I noticed about people's reaction to it was that women seemed to <laughs> know exactly what it was about. And guys would say, yeah, hey, yeah, I don't know, canoes, you know, geez, I know about that. And, Bow and Arrow, I did that, yeah. I don't think Borman and I don't think my father were interested in having people walk out of the movie feeling good. They wanted people to walk out of that movie feeling like they had been run through a ringer. And you can't forget Deliverance because you can't write it off emotionally or psychologically. Don't ever do nothing like this again. Don't come back up here. Jim Dickey would haunt the cinemas when it was being shown and he would walk along the lines of people were saying you're gonna get your money's worth today boy I'm telling you here this is one great movie you know but unfortunately as the years went by recently all the conflicts that we had originally about the script resurfaced and wanted to remake the film that was during a period in his professional life when he was not as productive and creative as he had been before and I think it was sort of a, a passing project uh, I think ultimately he was probably happy with the movie as it was. Yes, I was nominated as producer and as director and uh, Tom Priestley for the editing and it was a very strong year. Then. It was Godfather, Cabaret. I think there were probably five films nominated as Best Picture that year that could have won um, in any time in the last, in the last ten years. When you make you know, a very successful film of this nature it has a quality of, of bonding you together with the people who made it, particularly when you've been through something like this was, the making of this was rather like being to war, you know. So I've remained friends with all those four actors and Vilma Sigmund and seen them all from time to time over those years. While we've all gone through our different adventures in life and we've changed and certainly gotten older, Still, there's the, the same characters, the same boys that made the film back there are still alive, you know. It was really a life-changing thing. I mean, it, it, uh, <laughs> it opened doors that I didn't even know existed <laughs> before that. Burt Reynolds looked at me one day and said, you're really good in this. I said, what? He said, you know, you're really, really good in this. I said, oh, thank you, Burt. He said, no, oh, thank you, Burt. He said, you know, you're going you're gonna to do films. <laughs> sure, but God bless him, Bird did an awful lot to help me have that film career. So the film was filled with these extraordinary moments uh, of my life that I'll never forget. Not only was it my uh, deliverance out of television and, and, and certainly uh, some bad movies, uh, but uh, into another area that I'd never been in. But without John, I swear to you, this movie would have been half as effective. I mean, he was 100% over the top. You know, it's just his energy, his, the way he works. It's God's gift to John, you know. In the 70s, the studios depended on directors and gave them an enormous amount of power. When I made Deliverance, there was no, uh, no notes from the studio. We didn't preview it, there were no sneak previews, there were no audience cards and things. And today, this kind of film would be made in a much different way. But the 70s were a period of originality and daring. 
not taken into account. You know, there were all sorts of possibilities available to us that hadn't been before.